Thank you. And thank you all for staying awake till this point in time. Uh, I'll start with the good news. There is no way I'm going to use 40 minutes. Uh, I, I have two parts to what I want to say. Uh, one is the subject of financing growth. But since you've already heard so much about it, and we've had the opportunity because of the brilliant organization and the ability to bring the group of ministers that we've had here who've asked us questions and we've had the opportunity to ask them questions or hear that, I think we got one large part of that done, sending the message. And in fact, because of the national television that was organized, we actually got a chance to say that to the whole country. So I think more on that is probably going to be unwarranted as one of the last sessions in the mid-afternoon. I will say just a couple of things that uh, I did not get a chance to say on the first day and I think are important. One is the distinction that is frequently made between foreign investors and Indian investors. If you stop and think about it, which domestic investor, which domestic manufacturer, which domestic entrepreneur would not want simple regulation, red carpet instead of red tape, cost of capital to be as low as is possible, legal protection from a fair system, and a level playing field. The only real distinction is that the foreign investor would want a stable rupee. So that currency is an important question. When you have a sliding currency, the foreign investor is losing money on a great scale on the currency, and he has that one point of differentiation versus the domestic investor. Otherwise, there really is no difference in the motivations, because we frequently hear this of the difference between domestic and overseas investors. And I'd say overwhelmingly, both groups of people are looking for exactly the same things. The second point I'm going to make is both groups are looking for an absence of surprises. Whether it is in taxes, new regulations, something you didn't understand, both groups are looking for knowing what the system is and hoping that the rules of the game do not change. Right? We have a great deal to develop, whether you believe my need for 13 to 14 percent growth, the Chief Minister of Goa telling us about how he was able to actually achieve those numbers, so we know it is not an impossible task. In fact, it has been done, as I pointed out the other day, in China and in all the tigers of Asia have all had long periods of growth like that. They're smaller countries, but that's why I also throw China into the mix. But a couple of points on development. Development occurs with the help of other people. We cannot do it alone. So for development, if you look at the examples of what has happened in other places, people have had trade links, have had foreign investment, have looked for best practices from around the globe, and that's the efficient way and the way we should go also. Not try to go it alone, but really try to look for what we can get from other places. L let's not try and reinvent that wheel. People have tried it and have succeeded with, with that method, the method of using as much of external help as they can get. What's the role of government here? I think primarily three things, and these are the messages I think that we got across the other day. Macroeconomics, that makes sense. Making sure there isn't runaway inflation, making sure that the cost of capital is available at a reasonable price, making sure that there is an efficient judiciary that deals with things quickly, because justice delayed is justice denied. And to provide regulations rather than provide services. Regulations that provide a, a field. So don't do banking yourself. You don't need to control the banks. Just make, set up the rules so that banks can operate 
if you want certain sectors to be favored, throw that into the rules. Let everybody compete on, the, on that set of rules and you'll probably get better outcomes because you have people that will be driven only by the needs of their institution. The, the last point I want to make is on this subject is that we have often in the same self-congratulatory fashion talked about our great potential but that potential doesn't matter till we actually achieve it. So going back to the implementation, implementation, implementation thing, you know, if we don't get there, it doesn't matter. And the way to judge our success on that is from success stories. As you see, what is now called the startup rush, when I was a kid, people used to say, beta industry chalao, is the same idea, just different language. But it's much more prevalent and people are willing to take more risk because of the availability of information and the availability of capital from sources other than your own. And so that's, you know, a huge, uh, a huge difference which could translate our potential. But China had potential all of the last century. It was not till Deng came into power that it actually got utilized. There was a swamp in Malaysia that would perhaps been a swamp forever if Lee Kuan Yew had not come in with a different vision. And with the, the focus on getting things implemented, with a date and a time to everything, and, and that's what we need. Final point on this subject, the role of the states. I think the states will become more and more important. States like UP are bigger than countries like the UK or France or Germany and should be able to provide greater and greater competition versus other states. And that's beginning to happen. We used to only see overseas officials from the central government. But we now see frequently chief ministers, I think I met five in the last year, who have come trying to attract you to your state. And that I think is a fantastic thing. That model works very well in the other big federal system in the United States where states compete very heavily with each other and is something that should be encouraged. I'm going to pause here before I go to my next completely different topic. In case anybody has a question, and I won't be offended if there are no questions. Don't feel obliged to ask one. Okay. So, hearing no questions, I will go to my second unrelated topic. Uh, how many people in this audience would you raise your hands if you're over 40 years of age? If you do not have either, leave your hands up, if you do not have diabetes or high blood pressure, drop your hands. Okay, so sizable group. I'm talking to you guys most of all, but I'm talking to this whole room on the next thing. As you know, we have a major epidemic of diabetes in this country. It is not well followed because a lot of people do not get tested sufficiently. And the same thing is true for blood pressure. I bring this up because as a consequence of this, on an estimate, on a model basis, there are 204 million people. This is a model with similar numbers from PGI Chandigarh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and a report that's called the SEEK report. Estimates that there are 204 million people with chronic kidney disease, and 9.6 million people that have end-stage renal disease, which is the last stage of kidney failure. When you are in that stage, it is only a matter of time it's, it's months, maybe a couple of years, but not more than that, before your kidneys fail. We often don't know what kidneys do for us, but kidneys keep the whole system running. We think about heart attacks, we think about strokes, but it's the kidney that manages the electrolytes that run all the other functions. Too much potassium controlled by your kidney and your heart beats too fast. In fact, you could have a heart attack if it's 20% higher 
than the high end of the normal range. You have a significant risk of a heart attack. And many people will never know that that was the reason that they had a heart attack. Kidneys do a lot of other things. You know, uh, they, they make sure we regulate energy well. They make sure that we eat well. So they do a whole bunch of things because they're constantly managing all of the electrolytes in our systems and flushing out stuff that we don't need, hoarding stuff that we need. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because prevention, for those of you who are 40, is still possible. It gets less down the road as you progress. And for those of you under 40, you've got a great chance now to start working on not getting diabetes and not getting kidney disease. In most cases, 80 to 90% of the cases, it is completely preventable by diet and exercise. And so you don't want to get to being one of those 9.6 million people that need dialysis. So why am I telling you this and why have I picked on the kidney? There are a number of you who have offered your hands to me as I walked around and I have quickly gone to our Indian Namaskar. Some of you have had the time to ask why. Some of you have politely just accepted that as the idiosyncrasy of an old man. But the reason is, in February this year, my kidneys failed. So I've gone through the experience of living and understanding what this failure actually means. And what it meant was, I started to understand what I need to do. Everyone here in the room probably knows that. There's a thing called kidney dialysis, where the dialysis substitutes for your kidney and cleans your kidney out. What you may not realize is it's a three to three and a half hour process depending on where you've had it. In the US, it's typically in that range. In Europe, it tends to be four hours. I've had it in both places, so I have a feeling for it. It's a hard to schedule thing if you don't have a regular place. So if you travel, it's hard to schedule. And for some reason, particularly hard in Europe compared to the States, but it's not easy in the States. Dialysis involves three to three and a half hours, as I said, of lying on a bed. It's tiring even though you're not doing anything. When you move, the machines freak out. So you really can't do much productively. You can't be on the phone, you can't read things on your iPad, because those movements set off the alarms on the machine. And so you really have to just lie there reasonably still for that whole period. If it takes you, depending on where you live, half an hour to get there and back, and 15 minutes to adjust the tubes to you and remove the tubes, it's a roughly five hour process, three times a week typically. I had it three times a week. The other choice is that you get a kidney. Of the countries that have rules on this, about 195 countries, 160 countries actually have rules. Only one, Iran, permits the purchase of a kidney. They actually have a kidney exchange. You can legally buy a kidney. The other 159 countries forbid the sale of a kidney. So you are dependent upon cadavers, people that die, and have thought ahead about leaving their organs when they die if they are still usable. So most of these are automobile accidents, things like that, where you get them. Typically because the time taken has to be very short from removal from the cadaver to putting it into a person, there's a limited amount of use for that. So that in the state of New York alone where I live, 18,000 people die every year because they cannot get a kidney. These statistics have to be much worse in India. The other choice is that somebody gives you a kidney. And of course, there are a number of people, I'm sure everybody in this room knows of someone that has had a family member, a husband, a wife, a father, a child, a friend, 
that has given them a kidney. One of the most beautiful moments in my life, other than perhaps the birth of my children, was when a number of people stepped forward to offer me their kidney. You think of kidneys, you think that you have to have a match and that's it. Actually the match problem has been well solved by modern medicine. There's much more scope to immunosuppress your body so it does not attack a foreign kidney and so that part is actually much more liberal than where it was before. The hard part is having a match that is a healthy person. So you have someone, my wife for example was found to be pre-diabetic and so she could not give me her kidney. My daughter had the same set of genes and is a granddaughter, my, my mother-in-law died of kidney disease from diabetes so my immediate family was ruled out for that reason. My sisters, one had a thyroid condition and was ruled out for that reason, the other had high blood pressure and was ruled out for that reason. So the challenge actually is to find someone that is willing to give you a kidney and can pass these tests. I was fortunate. I had volunteers who were pretty healthy and could pass those tests. However, I came upon, it was a moral dilemma for me. And I, I was told that every recipient of a potential kidney goes through this psychological issue of wondering whether if they take a kidney from someone, Will they have a problem in the future? And will you be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, so-and-so gave me their kidney, but their brother or their mother or their father or their child needed it at a future point in time? It's really difficult. It, it may sound like not a big problem, but it's really difficult. And so I decided to like, postpone the thing till the last possible moment. In my sequence, I should have mentioned the difficulty with people at this point because then I started to have all these, when I got over this moral issue, I started to have the problem of the volunteers having issues prohibiting them from giving me a kidney. There are a sequence of tests that are done on the people that give you these kidneys. And one of the donors that failed these tests pushed back at the system and said, explain why I failed the test. And was told, you failed the glucose tolerance test, which means that you are probably pre-diabetic. He argued back, no one in my family has been diabetic. It's just, I'm sure, a temporary thing. Give me some time. They said, look, you know, you're at risk, you're overweight, you're at the high end of BMI that we accept. You're 60 years of age, you're not ideal for this. He said, I've run the marathon, yeah, I'm a little obese now, but I can get myself down into the state that you want. So this donor, not content to quickly walking away from having offered me a kidney and then very solid reason was given to him, don't give it to me, said, if I lose weight, will it solve the problem? And he was told, well, maybe. So in the course of the next four weeks, he proceeded to lose the 20 pounds that they asked him to lose. And came back for another test at the hospital and was told, you can go ahead. Before doing that, seeing the worry, particularly of my children, he sat down with all three of them and said, don't worry, I'm here for the program, I'm going to get this done. And so he went and, as I said, over the next few weeks, lost the weight that he needed to do, came back, tested all right, and then on July 1st of this year, he 
proceeded to donate his kidney to me. This is a fellow IITian, which is why I wanted to tell you this story. From my class, one of my closest friends for the last 40 years, He's here today. I think many of you know Dhananjay Sahiba. And I asked him to come up here because I would not be here if he was not there. Parag had uh, threatened to embarrass me at this event and he has obviously succeeded. He has made me cry. <coughs> it's an incredible moment um, to be here. Um, and before I, before I, you know, tell you a little bit about what I went through, uh, I, I need to thank my family, uh, my mom, my sister, my brother, because without their help <laughs> and support, I couldn't have done this. But um, um, <clears throat> for me, uh, since I, you know, I don't have an immediate family of my own in the sense I'm not, I'm, I'm divorced uh, and I don't have any children, it was a little easier decision for me to do this than, than uh, for a lot of other people. Um, and. Um, uh, as Parag described, when they said, you know, you're too fat, man, you got to, <laughs> we can't take your kidney, you know, you're a rask. I said, man, I'll, you know, I'll do whatever I can, uh, or whatever I need to. I don't know if I'll be successful. I'll put in all the effort I can, and I'm uh, happy to report that I, I, I did manage to do what I needed to do and get this done. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, one of the best moments of the whole uh, event is, you know, you go, I went to the hospital uh, bright and early. We had to go at like 6.30 in the morning or something like this and for the, on the day of the surgery. And then, uh, you know, you get dressed up and they put armbands on you and all this sort of stuff. And then this guy turns up with a questionnaire. And he's like, you know, what's your name? Where are you from? Who's the donor? I mean, uh, you know, who's the recipient of the kidney and so forth? And then he asked me, he says, are you pregnant? So I'm like, hello? So, no, no, just checking if you're awake. You know? <laughs> anyway, um, we got this done. And, uh, you know, it gives me so, it, I mean, I, it's hard to describe uh, what I feel when I see Parag and his family. Uh, I, I, the only thing I, w I will say is it re reminds me of uh, that great song by Hemant Kumar, Zindagi Pyar Ki Do Char Ghadi Hoti Hai. And this is one of those moments for us. Thank you. Thank you so much.